What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat. BDGE, fantasy football. It's Tuesday, so we're diving into the waiver wires. Top waiver wire pickups for week 10 and going forward. I know I always give a little sign of encouragement. Hey, if you're one in five or if you're two and four, there's plenty of time to turn this thing around. It's getting late, guys. It's, it's, it's time. It's time to grow up. It's time to get rolling. If you ain't gonna do it now, we're gonna have issues. This will be the last one I'll give you a pass on. If you're still hurting, if you're two and two and seven, eh, you probably ain't making the playoffs. But if you're wrapped up in there, there's still plenty of time. We still got half of the season. Week 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You got five weeks. You can pull off a five game rip right now and feel pretty goddamn good about it. So I'm gonna help you do that. I'm gonna tell you the top guys to pick up for week 10 fantasy football. Everyone on this list is owned in 55% or less of Yahoo Leagues, position by position, quarterbacks all the way down to the defensive streaming options. Week 10, let's get it. First off, just want to say thank you for joining me. Of course, if you've been rocking with my videos so far this summer, this year, if I've helped you out at all, I would appreciate a thumbs up on this video. Any kind of thumbs up, comment, any of that stuff helps your boy navigate through the algorithm, the YouTube algorithm, because all these big platforms are starting to get on YouTube now. They, they done seen the success that is here for that. Any kind of engagement down below is very much appreciated. Uh, but let's dive into the players. First up on this list is the quarterbacks. Um, and I write this blog post before Monday Night Football. This video is coming on Tuesday, so I, 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 w I already watched the game, but I didn't include anyone's on this list, but uh, Marcus Mariota is an obvious name right now. He's 27% owned. He had a big game last night, a big fantasy game that Tennessee offense looked a little bit better, and this was against a tough Dallas defense. Now, they did lose Sean Lee like halfway through the game. Um, that being said, though, they've been very good on the outside against wide receivers and defending the pass. So Marcus Mariota looked pretty good. Um, you know, he's been so far from consistent, as are all the all, all the quarterbacks pretty much on this list this week, so I'm not confident in the pickup, but you could do worse than Marcus Mariota. He's playing at home against New England, so they probably will have to score a bunch of points. I don't hate Marcus Mariota. Um, Alex Smith is, is another quarterback on this list that I think is a viable streaming option for Week 10. He is owned in 43% of Yahoo Leagues. He has been pretty much nothing but awful as a fantasy quarterback in 2018, but he is coming off of his first 300-yard game of the season. Uh, against the Falcons, he gets another ridiculously good matchup in that NFC South at Tampa Bay, who is the only team allowing more fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks than Atlanta. Um, and Smith is averaging about 15 rushing yards a game, which is a nice little boost to the quarterback position. Um, so there's a little bit of, uh, of upside and floor there with Smith uh, in a great matchup. Now, the Redskins, I will say, like uh, I'm not really confident in any of the guys on this list because the Redskins are going to be without... Uh, a few of their offensive linemen right now. They had two big injuries occur on Sunday. They're already without Trent Williams. So Brandon Scherf tours Peck, uh, and they have Trent Williams, like I said, already sidelined for a couple weeks. And Sean Lovau, I don't know, some Hawaiian name where like all it's like A U O U A U, that kind of shit all mixed together. He's gonna be out too. So they got three of their starting linemen hurt. And uh, while my confidence is Smith is pretty much. A negative. It's it's at a negative level right now. Streaming against Tampa Bay seems to be a solution to just about any problem in 2018 fantasy football. They have allowed multiple passing touchdowns in all but one game on the entire year. They have one interception on the season, and that came all the way back in week three, so they are not getting any better as the season progresses. Um, they've also allowed 33 or more rushing yards to the quarterback position in three of their last five games. Like I said, Smith is a guy who does add that dynamic to his game. I'm um, not going to spend any more than a couple bucks on him, but he is one of my top streamers this week. Baker Mayfield is next up on this list, 38% owned. And again, he's been hard to trust as a fantasy quarterback uh, as well this year, but he has strung together three straight games with multiple passing touchdowns. He just missed throwing for 300 passing yards on Sunday. And just like uh, Alex Smith, Mayfield benefits from playing an NFC South opponent. He will take on the Falcons a week after Alex Smith almost threw for 300 yards. Mayfield will get his second consecutive home game. I like when quarterbacks play multiple home games in a row. I think it gives them a lot more time to prepare and, and gets them more comfortable for the game upcoming. Um, the Falcons' offense is clicking right now on all cylinders, so it's a game where I think Mayfield and the Browns, for as good as their pass defense and as good as their you know pass rush has been all year, I don't think it's a, a, a game where the Falcons aren't going to score a lot of points because you know they are very hot right now, and I think they're going to keep things rolling. Falcons have allowed 335 or more passing yards 
through the air, two opposing quarterbacks in six of their last seven games, guys. That is a major, 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 major opening for fantasy quarterbacks. Shard Higgins is back in the lineup, which is a, a minor boost to Mayfield. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here fucking grasping for straws, telling you I'm excited about Rashard Higgins getting back in the lineup. But I think he's a good compliment to Antonio Callaway, who's been pretty trash this year. So it's a nice little upgrade for... Um, Mayfield, and now we have the new coaches in place, and we saw them getting Duke Johnson really involved in this game, and I think that's that's what's really going to help um, Baker moving forward. And I actually want to bring up this tweet that I forgot to transfer over to the um, article, so I want to... I can't find it, but basically what it was saying was um, on throws to Duke Johnson this year, Baker Mayfield is like 26 for 30 with 275 passing yards, and a touchdown or something like his numbers thrown to Duke Johnson were ridiculous, and it's such an advantage. I've been talking about this since, um, you know, since the summer, and that's why I was so high on guys like Derek McKinnon before he got hurt. Of course, is because when you have coaches who want to throw the ball to playmaking running backs on early downs, it's it's so successful for an offense to run plays like that. So um, with the new coaching staff, we saw them do that a little bit with Duke Johnson, and hopefully that is part of their game plan going forward. So I like Baker Mayfield in week 10 at home against Atlanta. So I would take Mayfield over Alex Smith. Third guy on this list, Nick Mullins. San Francisco 49ers, man. Stream him at your own peril, but I'm just going to throw him out there so you guys, you know, so he's on your radar. If you are in a very deep league or if you're in a two-quarterback league, he tore it up against Oakland on Thursday Night Football, 262 yards and three touchdowns. He did it on like 20 three or 26 completions or something like that. Um, so his yards per attempt were very, very, very high and expect those to come down because that was against Oakland, guys. So their their pass rush is, is, is literally non-existent. So um, it's probably not that difficult for someone who, you know, if you're a new quarterback just coming into the game for the first time, the game starts to move very fast and defenders get on you very quickly. When you have Oakland who doesn't get to the quarterback whatsoever, it's a lot easier on a quarterback like Nick Mullins. Now the 49ers get a plus matchup against the Giants. The Giants will have to travel across the country to take on the Niners. Um, so again, like I'm not confident whatsoever in starting Nick Mullins, but if you are, I mean, listen, there are people who play in big ass leagues and, uh, and I had to stream fucking in one of my dynasty leagues, I streamed Nathan Peterman and I came away with the fucking W. I could have picked up Nick Mullins and played him. I should have done that, but like, I don't know. I let Peter God roll and he did his damn thing, baby. So those are my top streaming options for week 10 at the quarterback position. We got Baker, we got Alex Smith, we have Marcus Mariota, and we have Nick Mullins moving over to the running back position. Now we've got uh, we've got some interesting ads. Normally we don't really have too many good ads on the waiver wire this week. Um, and I'm gonna run down them in order of their Yahoo ownership, not so much in order of my preference of, of getting them, but I'll go in a little deeper towards that. Before we do that, I want to take a minute to thank today's sponsors for the video. FantasyJocks.com, y'all know what it is. They've been repping your mans all summer, and I will rep them gladly back because they have the highest quality gear when it comes to your fantasy football league. Whether it is a championship belt, you can get these customized to say your league name on here. You can get all the previous winners' names engraved on the side, so it's something that you guys keep for years and years and years. Very high quality stuff. I use it for all of my big money leagues. They have belts. They have rings if you want to go a little bit more conspicuous. They have trophies if you want to keep it on your work desk if you're in a work league or something like that. You can get all the names engraved on those as well. They have draft boards if you do other sports. They got all this stuff, guys. Go check out fantasyjocks.com. Today's sponsor, Use promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP for 10% off your purchase. That's all I got for y'all. Let's get into the running backs. Um, the first one, or the first two on this list are the duo of the Oakland Raiders backfield, Jalen Michard and Doug Martin. Both of them are 53% owned, so just make the threshold here. Nothing about this offense intrigues me, especially after that Thursday night football game. They looked awful. But both of the guys are going to get their fair share of volume working as a tandem going forward. If I had to pick one... I would pick none, but if I had to really, really pick one, I'd pick Jalen Richard. Um, I just think his involvement in the passing game is just a lot more valuable than Martin's 10 to 13 carries, which might net him 40 to 60 yards and probably not scoring a touchdown. So I don't love either of them, and I probably wouldn't spend more than the 3 to $5, but if you're in a PPR league, I think Richard's a pretty good pickup. Next on this list, and I think this is a big pickup, who I kind of mentioned before is Duke Johnson of the Browns, 48% owned. Dukey has been pretty much invisible up to this point in the season, but with Huey and Haley out, right, their coach, their offensive coordinator, the fuck out of Cleveland, they have promoted Freddie Kitchens. That's a great name, by the way. He was a running backs coach. 
and he was promoted to offensive coordinator, and clearly he remembers, as the running back coach, because he sees it every day, he remembers the skill set that Dookie Johnson brings to this offense. It's one that can contribute nine catches for 78 yards and multiple touchdowns. It's one that opens up the field for Baker Mayfield, that makes it a lot easier for him to throw the ball, that he doesn't always have to depend on downfield throws to fucking Antonio Callaway and Rashard Higgins. So, Duke Johnson's coming off a very big game, of course, and important thing to note here, or not to note, but how you decipher this is going to depend on how you see things. Do you think it was a coincidence that Freddie Kitchens took over and Duke Johnson got more involved? Because Duke ended up leading the team in targets, receptions, yards, and obviously touchdowns with two. Uh, he had a 21.4% of the team's target share in this one. And if you look at Adam Leviton's tweet here, the difference in Duke Johnson yesterday wasn't playing time. Got his usual 36 of 72 snaps, 30 out of the backfield, but nine targets after averaging just 3.6 um, targets per game under Hugh Jackson. Now that's the big difference here. He didn't play more snaps, which I don't know, that could concern, that kind of concerns me more than it actually excites me because if he's not playing more, that means that those target numbers are not necessarily a predictive value. Like the way I look at it, I'm, I'm very intrigued by this and I, I wish like more people kind of, uh, I wish this was a bigger statistic here because people like to zone in on like the number of targets that a certain running back gets or whatever. And Duke, Duke Johnson got nine targets this game after averaging, like you said, 3.6. So he was not getting the ball at all. Do those nine targets, are those contributed to the fact that it was a new coach and they actually ran plays for Duke Johnson? Or did it just so happen that, I don't know, the Falcons got a lot of pressure on Baker Mayfield and his first read or the dump off was his most utilized pass in this game and he just needed to get the ball off. Like RB targets are difficult because it's not always like the play was not designed for them. You know what I mean? It's more so like what is happening in the pocket. But of course there are going to be times where the running back comes out of the slot or the running back um, catches screen passes and stuff like that. And I think that's like a bigger discussion that kind of needs to be had when you're deciphering a game like this. Like, can you say it just happened to be an outlier of a game where Duke Johnson got nine targets out of nowhere? Or can you contribute to the fact that it was new coaching and they had plays where they designed it to go to Duke Johnson? I think that's the big biggest takeaway here is you need to figure out whether or not you think that's the, um, what you think is the right answer in that situation. Prior to this game, Duke was averaging just over five touches a game, and he hadn't had more than six touches in a single game in 2018 so far. Looking back to 2017, if you take out week one, the only week in which he had less than six touches, Duke had six or more touches in every single game last year. So he hadn't had more than six touches in a single game this year yet until Sunday. Now, Atlanta Falcons are up next on the Browns schedule. And as we know, they literally, they are the Red Cross of pass catching running backs donations. They donate fantasy points to running backs that are utilizing the passing game, right? Again, it comes back to, was it a fluky outlier? Or do you think Duke is going to continue to get more and more involved? Like he said, the snaps weren't at a huge increase, which worries me because if the snaps are going to stay the same, that doesn't always mean that the volume of touches is going to increase. So um, I think you need to figure out what you want from there or what you, what you believe is the right thing. And then that's going to kind of tell the story of how much fab you spend on him. I think if you're desperate for running back, especially in PPR leagues, I would probably be dropping anywhere from 10 to $20 on him. I'm, I'm fine with that. Third up on this list, we'll kind of get cruising here. Uh, Ito Smith of the Falcons, 44% owned. Everyone in the Falcons offense, eight in week nine. Even fucking Julio Jones got in the end zone. I was actually kind of low-key hoping that he never got in the end zone just because it would be kind of funny. But you do simple math. Everyone on the Falcons offense, eight. Ito Smith is a member of the Falcons offense. Therefore, if so facto, I'm your boss. Ito Smith, eight in this one. Carried the ball 10 times, 60 yards on the ground. Looked really good running in between the tackles. Something that Tevin Coleman has not looked good doing so far this year. Uh, he caught a touchdown, or he, he ran in for a touchdown. He caught one of two targets for four yards. Since Devonta Freeman was sent to the IR, Smith has steadily kind of flirted with that double-digit touch mark, whether a couple above or one or two below. Um, so that's kind of what you could project on a weekly basis, him getting about double-digit, like 10 touches or so. His fantasy production, however, does very, very much rely on touchdowns because he's not that involved in the passing game. There are a couple games where he'll catch, you know, two or three passes and go for 30 or 40 yards. But for the most part, um, you are relying on touchdowns for Edo Smith. But he has done that in four or five games since Freeman has went down, four of their last five games. Um, and he's currently dominating this offense in terms of red zone touches. He has 15 red zone carries on the year compared to just eight for Tevin Coleman. Both have 
five carries inside the 10-yard line, and Coleman has one more carry on the goal line than Smith does, but it's kind of like a coin flip betting on who is going to score in this backfield. Um, obviously, you'd much rather have Tevin Coleman going forward, but Edo Smith is not a terrible play, especially on like a, a, a heavy bye week thing. Um, you know, the stretch of bye weeks. He is a low floor guy um, that I think you could fit into your flex if, if you are pretty desperate. He is also arguably one of the most important handcuffs in fantasy football because if Coleman goes down, Edo Smith is probably taking a monster, monster role in this backfield. Next up on this list is Frank Gore, owned in 28% of leagues. Uh, nothing about Gore wants me to put him in any of my fantasy lineups right now, but he got 20 carries on Sunday, man. 20 carries. That's that's. It's got to be on the radar. Um, and that makes six consecutive games for Gore with double-digit carries. And this offense stinks. His efficiency stinks. He won't get a lot of goal line looks. So it's difficult to actually trust Gore whatsoever. But, you know, do do with this information what you want. They're at Green Bay. Then they get a bye. Then they're at Indianapolis. I'm not going crazy about Gore, but again, there are people who are very desperate at the running back position. 20 carries is something that you're not going to get on the wire very often. This guy, however, will probably get about 20 carries, depending on the health situation of his backfield mates. Mike Davis of the Seattle Seahawks, 24% owned. He is arguably, he's probably, if I had to choose one guy on the waiver wire this week, he's probably my number one waiver wire pickup, owned in just 24% of leagues. And as been the case all season, Davis is Chris Carson's direct backup and uh, took over as a workhorse on Sunday when Carson, I guess it's a new injury, right? So he came into the week with like a hip a hip injury. Um, and then I believe he he didn't re-aggravate. I think it's a new injury, a thigh injury. I just want to actually point out that it's fucking amazing that the Seahawks used their first round pick on Rashad Penny and they just don't use him whatsoever. It's absolutely incredible. But that's neither here nor here. Davis ran... Um, well on Sunday. He ran the ball 15 times for 62 yards. He caught seven passes for another 42 yards. The 22 touches after Carson left, uh, Penny was used a little bit, but Mike Davis's 22 touches bested the rookie by 15. So it was a 22 to seven touch split. Um, Davis has been very, very useful in games where Carson has left with injury or he hasn't played at all. And this is the second game of, you know, of their eight game or nine game season so far that Mike Davis has topped 100 in total yards. And we look at Adam Leviton's tweet. Chris Carson left after 10 snaps yesterday. Massive usage for Mike Davis after that. 59 snaps, 15 carries, 8 targets. Rashad Penny, Rashad Penny, excuse me, only 12 snaps, 4 carries, 3 targets. So Seattle preached all summer about wanting to run the ball. And that's exactly what they've done to not really their detriment. So shout out to the Seahawks for, for being able to get this damn thing done. They are currently leading the NFL with 31.8 rush attempts per game. They are also first in the NFL in percentage of their plays being runs as opposed to passes at 50.8%. They are the only team in the NFL over 47% of their pays, plays coming by way of the ground. They are third in the NFL in rushing yards per game. And their offensive line, which is still atrocious in terms of pass blocking, it's quietly not that bad this year. They are ranked 14th in running back run blocking per Football Outsiders. They're still ranked 29th per Pro Football Focus. So I don't really know, you know, like who knows, but clearly they're better this year than they have been in previous years. And just the reason Mike Davis is on this list is because Chris Carson is clearly hurt. So this is the last update we have from Pete Carroll and the Seahawks camp. Um, Chris Carson is sore and won't do much of practice this week. Carson is believed to be battling a new thigh issue after having his leg wrapped following his exit from Sunday's loss to the Chargers. He was previously said to have, to have a hip or groin problem. Either way, it sounds like Carson will be looking at a questionable tag for Week 10 against the Rams. Uh, let me check real quick if we have any updates as of this morning on Chris Carson. I don't believe we do. If he is out, Mike Davis is clearly going to be featured, and he's going to get a shitload of touches. Like I said, they traveled to LA to face off against the Rams for the second time in 2018. The Rams just got absolutely scorched by Alvin Kamara a week after allowing 7.2 yards per carry and a touchdown to Aaron Jones in their first meeting, I think it was back in week five. Chris Carson and Mike Davis combined to rush for 184 yards and a touchdown on 31 carries against the Rams, which is 5.9 yards per carry. If Carson misses time, again, Mike Davis will be a high-end RB2 with a lot of volume in a very rush-heavy offense. So if Carson misses serious time, if we have a report that like Carson misses multiple weeks, Davis is someone I would I would blow the rest of my fab budget on, If especially if you need a running back. He's a great flex ad. He can be a high-end RB2 for you um, just because of his volume and the way this offense runs. So very, very high on Mike Davis if something were to happen to Carson. I'm still going to use 10 to 15 bucks because 
if I had to guess, it doesn't sound like Chris Carson is going to play in week 10. But again, I'm just a doctor, so I don't know. Last running back on this list is um, Elijah McGuire of the New York Jets. 14% owned now. The second year Jets running back, who missed the first eight games due to a broken foot in the summer, made his 2018 debut on Sunday, and he immediately was slotted into that role behind Isaiah Crowell as the Jets' RB2. He carried the ball seven times for 30 yards. He saw five targets. He caught three of them for another 37 yards. Um, and although Crowell saw six more carries than McGuire, McGuire actually outsnapped Crowell 33-23 to on Sunday. So um, interesting to see that he was actually playing more snaps than Crowell, and they're not they're clearly not easing him back into this offense. He's ready to roll, and they're going to use him as much as they can. But again, I'm not going to go crazy about McGuire. I will echo my concern with him. Uh, as It's with the whole offense. They look horrible. They look miserable, of course. Um, and there might be a, f a few games where he's totally useless, useless outside of full PPR leagues because I doubt he's going to get a lot of goal line looks. And they aren't scoring a lot. And they just don't throw the ball to their running backs when they get into the red zone. Looking at this chart, you can see Jets at 4%. The chart on the left side, this is uh, the percentage of targets. So the target share to each position inside the red zone. The Jets are an NFL low 4% of their targets go to the running back in the red zone. Um, and you have teams like, oh, who, who would have known? The Chargers, the, the Saints, the Patriots all lead the NFL. And they're pretty good offenses, right? They, they might have an idea. They might want to take some notes from them, the Jets. So they don't use McGuire. They don't use their running backs in the passing game down by the end zone. And that's where McGuire excels in the passing game. But like I said, it's clear that they don't, uh, they don't have a plan to slowly work him into the offense. He's going to be a part of this offense. And I think he's like a double-digit touch weekly guy. He's almost like a, he's almost like a Nito Smith and um, probably in a worse offense. So that's kind of how I would compare the two. And he's, he's more involved around the same volume as Nito Smith. He'd be more involved in the passing game. So they get Buffalo at home, which is a good matchup and then a bye, then the Patriots at home. So a couple good matchups. And then just a couple other notes I wanted to add here. I didn't really put them on the list, but Josh Adams, the Philadelphia Eagles running back is 10% owned. And I'm not going to put guys on this list again that were on the previous week's waiver wire thing because they had a buy. So they get Dallas at home, who was just torched by Deion Lewis. Uh, Josh Adams is a decent pickup if you are desperate, if you're looking for a high upside guy. Not the foreman. Um, we still like, we're hearing conflicting reports that he's supposed to return to practice. Then they're like, oh, we don't know if he's going to return. So I don't know. I'm not high on Dante Foreman whatsoever. I've been saying that to you guys for a while. And the other thing I want to say is handcuffs. So we're entering week 10. So the playoffs, the fantasy playoffs are just a few weeks away, right? Now is probably the time to start handcuffing your studs if you haven't already. And uh, the guys I would say are worthy of handcuffing would be Kareem Hunt with Spencer Ware. Uh, you have Malcolm Brown for Todd Gurley. You have Rod Smith for Ezekiel Elliott. I would even say Gio Bernard for Mixon. And I don't think Gio is heavily owned whatsoever. He returned to practice, so he'll be back in the game soon. Um... You know, Smith for Tevin Coleman. So those are the guys I would probably consider as real handcuffs. Um, off the top of my head, I haven't looked at all the teams to see who else would be handcuffs. But those are probably the elite guys that you need to have handcuffed now. You know, uh, buys are starting to finish up. So you'll have some, some bench space to maneuver around. And uh, now is when you want to get them. Because if your elite running back goes down and you don't have their, their handcuff going forward, you're going to be farked. And I ask again, very, very humbly, if you are enjoying the video, the podcast, whatever it is, whatever avenue you are listening this through, uh, a thumbs up or a rating and review would be very, very much appreciated. I appreciate you guys spending your time with me and, and valuing the bullshit that I spew out of my mouth. So uh, that's very much appreciated. Also, I talked about this in a few of my videos last week. I am looking to build a team for big dogs. We are bringing on team members. We are hiring we want people to apply as a content creator. So basically what I'm doing, but for other sports or other, um, whatever it is, like if you have a show idea that you would love to be on YouTube for, like whether it's you and your friend or you and you by yourself talking about fantasy basketball, baseball, soccer, esports, um, live streaming, fantasy bachelor. I don't really give a shit. Um, I'm looking to bring on some talented people that, want to put themselves in front of the camera. And I actually, I obviously have a platform to, to offer you an audience. Um, so if you think you'd be a good fit, if you want to check out more information, I will link that down below. It should be in the description that says BDGE is hiring. So apply now. 
Let's move into the wide receivers. First up on this list is Tyrell Williams of the Chargers. 45% owned. The guy just cannot stop scoring touchdowns. He's not getting a lot of targets, though. That's, that's the concern here. He had three targets on Sunday. He caught two of them, one of them, obviously, for a touchdown. It's his fifth touchdown of the year, fourth in the last three games. However, like I said, it's still really hard to trust a guy like Williams. He hasn't yet to see more than five targets in a single game. Um, and he has not seen five targets since week four. So that's that's very, very, very concerning if you are starting to get high on Terrell Williams. The situation reminds me a lot of Calvin Ridley, like we saw earlier in the year, right, where he had that crazy touchdown streak and everyone gets really high. But when you dove into the numbers, and I pointed this out in a lot of my videos, uh, he was still third, the third wide receiver on the team in terms of snaps, uh, in terms of volume and targets. So in a league where, in a game where touchdowns are extremely volatile and extremely hard to predict, you know, volume in terms of player usage is what's the most predictive thing in this situation. So if you're getting three targets and you're banking on one of them to be a touchdown, I, uh, I'm i not going to go crazy about Terrell Williams here. Definitely not spending more than a few dollars on him. He does get Oakland in his next matchup. So... Just going to throw that out there. He might be a good stream in, in this week. Next up on this list is the top waiver wire pickup for wide receivers. And I would put him underneath Mike Davis. It would probably go Mike Davis, this guy, Duke Johnson. Marquez Valdez-Scantling of the Green Bay Packers. 38% owned following the news that we heard of Geronimo Allison and that his injury is serious. He's going to miss some significant time and he might require surgery. It's very likely that his season is over. If not, he's going to miss you know a, a long a long period of time, meaning Marquez Valdez-Cantling is going to become a full-time player, which he has been doing over the last month or so, filling in for Cobb and Allison, who have you know taken turns being hurt and being out of the lineup. So, done a great job filling in for those guys. And he is the wide receiver two here in Green Bay now. Yes, he is ahead of Randall Cobb, for sure. He's outproduced him. He's outplayed him. Rodgers likes him more than Cobb. You can clearly see that when they're on the field. He has uh, 100 or more receiving yards in two of their last three games. He has caught two touchdowns in their last four games, and he has seen 27 targets over that span. Now, Adams is clearly the wide receiver one here. I'm never going to argue that. Um, now, with Cobb back at full health on Sunday, MBS actually outsnapped him, 81% of the snaps to 76% of the snaps, which was interesting to see. So he's playing over him in some wide receiver two sets, as well as obviously playing on all wide receiver, three wide receiver sets. I think it's very likely we see MBS settle in as the wide receiver two, like I said. I think he already is that, but I think we'll see the gap start to widening itself. And I think week over week, we're going to see kind of a battle between him himself and Jimmy Graham as to who is like the, not just the wide receiver two, obviously, but the weapon number two for Aaron Rodgers. So I think that's a position where, you know, if we're looking at it from the summer, I brought up a lot of stats where the wide receiver two in Green Bay, their average numbers for w when playing with Aaron Rodgers is like a crazy 80 catches, a thousand yards and eight or nine touchdowns. So obviously that's going to prorate itself out to the last five weeks of the season. But if you're going to get those numbers on a week over week basis, that's going to be super, super useful um, getting him off the waiver wire. They play against Miami at home next week, then at Seattle, at Minnesota. So a, a somewhat difficult schedule, but I think, you know, just the situation he's in is very, very good. If you are very desperate at wide receiver, um, I would be okay using your number one waiver wire on him. I would spend anywhere from 10 to 20, 25, 30, whatever you want to do on on, on Scantling, I think is a, um, a, legitimate, a legitimate target this week for your waiver wire. Third up on this list is Willie Sneed of the Ravens, 34%. Owned. He is extremely boring, but he has scored double-digit PPR fantasy points in seven of nine games this year. 78% of the time, he is giving you double-digit PPR points. He has seen six or more targets in eight of nine games, 89% of their games. And over the last four games, he's averaging nine targets a game. So he's a boring, high-floor player in PPR. Their schedule after their Week 11 bye is really, 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 really good. Or Week 10 bye, excuse me. Cincinnati. At home, Oakland at home, at Atlanta, at Kansas City, Tampa Bay at home, at Los Angeles Chargers. Um, in terms of those teams and fantasy points allowed to the wide receiver, Cincinnati fourth highest, Oakland 11th highest, Atlanta third highest, Kansas City 14th highest, Tampa Bay second highest, Chargers 15th highest. So he is someone that I would never start in standard league. I probably would never start in a half PPR league, but if you are in a PPR league, he's giving you a very, very safe floor and he's got a ridiculously good slate of matchups coming up. Next up on the list, David Moore of the Seattle Seahawks. 16% owned. Now, he didn't do much on Sunday. Uh, he only caught two of his seven targets for 16 yards, but the seven targets were a season high, and, and it was an encouraging sign to see him use this much 
coming a week after Brandon Marshall was released from the team. So David Moore is settling into uh, to a legit, you know, target option for Russell Wilson. And it was three more wide receiver. Uh, th those seven targets were three more targets than any wide receiver on the Seahawks on Sunday. Baldwin and Lockett both had just four targets on the day. So he led the wide receiver group in targets. And he actually leads the wide receivers of Seattle in targets over their last four games combined. And he is and he has an 18.6% target share of the offense. And he's getting a ton, a ton, a ton of end zone looks. And Russell Wilson trust, trusts him on one-on-one, -on -one, right? Like when, when he sees more by himself going down the field or near the end zone, he has no problem chucking it up and giving him a 50-50 ball. And uh, he had two easy touchdowns. Not easy touchdowns or tough plays, but he should have made the plays. He, he could have had two touchdowns on Sunday. He had two balls that were like in the middle of traffic, but still bounced off his hand. So he just as likely could have caught four or seven targets with two touchdowns and people would be a lot more hyped about David Moore. So if you're not, don't just look at the box score. Of course, I went back and watched the NFL game pass of this game because I wanted to see David Moore. Two touchdowns went off his hands in the end zone. Could have been a much, 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 much bigger day. So um, I would use a few dollars on him. I think he's someone that could surprise over the last, you know, four or five weeks of the season. So I like David Moore. I love Anthony Miller. Chicago Bears, 11% owned. He caught five of six, six targets on Sunday for, I think it was like 49 yards. Yeah, well, it was. 49 scoreless yards, which of course is going to go under the radar. But Trubisky only threw 12 passes on Sunday, of course, because they didn't need to throw against the Bills. So his six targets was 50% of the passes that Trubisky attempted. Um, he also drew a 43-yard pass interference penalty. Um, so a really productive day for Miller in terms of looking at it from, you know, in, in, when you use it, the context of how he played. So Miller was really good, and he gets ne uh, Detroit next week. And then again in week 12, who have been awful against the pass, of course. Um, and they've given up a lot of fantasy points to wide receivers as of late, especially slot wide receivers who have scored in four consecutive games against the Detroit Lions. Um, so a slot, was, slot wide receiver scored a touchdown in four consecutive games against the Lions. Miller gets them twice in the next three weeks. Allen Robinson is banged up. He has missed two straight games. Taylor Gabriel left the game late with a knee injury. Matt Nagy said it's not that serious, but we'll have to see. So they're a banged up wide receiver core. Miller might be the only healthy one really here to, um, to contribute to this passing offense. Now, Miller's ceiling is obviously going to be lower just because Mitchell Trubisky is atrocious at throwing the ball. But... If he's going to keep getting involved and seeing such a high target share while, you know, Taylor Gabriel, if one of those two is banged up, uh, Gabriel and Allen Robinson, that just leaves one of them on the outside. And Miller's running from the slot. The top cornerback is going to be shutting down that wide receiver, whoever it is. Taylor Gabriel's clearly not good enough to um, command wide receiver one type volume and beat, you know, Tredavious Whites of the NFL and things like that. So they get Detroit twice sandwiched in between a Minnesota home game. And uh, I, I think he's another good fill-in for, for this week if you need someone at flex or if you need a DFS player or something like that. Last up on this list is Maurice Harris of the Washington Redskins. He is literally unowned in Yahoo League, 0% owned. He had a huge game on Sunday. He caught 10 of 12 targets for 124 yards. He played his first game of the season in week five. Crowder, Jameson Crowder has missed weeks six through nine. Harris has filled in as the slot receiver in that span. He has run 75% of his snaps from the slot from weeks six through nine. So he's just filling right in for Crowder. Now, Maurice Harris had done almost nothing in terms of, you know, production prior to week nine. So I'm definitely not getting anywhere near as excited about Harris as anyone who's getting even a little bit excited about him. But he did play on a season high 80%, 87% of the team snaps on Sunday. Jameson Crowder was ruled out really early in week nine, which does not bode well for his week 10 status or just going forward. It looks like the injury is uh, clearly serious because he's missing multiple weeks now. Paul Richardson got placed on the IR yesterday. So there's a lot of opportunity for someone in the wide receiver group. No one has come out and produced. Jordan Reed has been horrible. Um, so clearly they're looking for another weapon. Maurice Harris happened to be the guy that did it in week nine. So we'll see how he goes moving forward. I'm not going to spend like any kind of serious amount of money on him, but I think, uh, I think he's someone to keep an eye on as they get Tampa Bay in week 11. So or in week 10. So that is definitely a matchup to take advantage of. And, uh, another couple of guys that I had on this list last week. So if you want to dive into their analysis, a little more depth, you can just go back to last week's waiver wire because they were on a buy Kiki Cutie. 27% owned and Christian Kirk, 25% owned. Christian Kirk has that, the new offense pretty much, right, under Byron Leftwich. So hopefully they keep continuing to progress and get a little bit better week over week. Kiki Cutie, um, I'm happy that they sat him out in week in week nine. 
so he can rest up his hamstring injury. Hopefully he gets his bye in week 10 and then he's healthy to go in week 11. I think he has um, a higher floor and a higher ceiling than, than a few people realize. So I like QD. I like Kirk. Again, if you want more in-depth analysis, check out last week's waiver wire. Let's move on to the tight ends. Um, we have Jack Doyle, another one who obviously was on my waiver wire list last week, was on a bye this week. So if you want his analysis, Go back to last week. He is the pass catcher to own at the tight end position in Indy. I don't care about Eric Ebron. Jack Doyle is that guy to own. He's only 38% owned, and I know a lot of that is because he was a buy, so a lot of people had to drop him. I got a lot of questions about that. So Jack Doyle was probably dropped this week, so I would highly, highly recommend you go get him. CJ Ozuma is the other guy. Uh, he's one of, I think, four guys that actually have on this list. Um, he's 38% owned. Now, he has had a couple of... We've seen his floor in a few of the games. And the only reason he's on this list right now is because AJ Green is going to be out for at least two weeks, if not more, which opens up targets in this entire offense. Now, this, this offense is going to dramatically come down in production because AJ Green is out of, out of the game. And he obviously opens up a lot of the defense for the other weapons here. But at that same time, there's going to be a lot of targets to go around now that he is gone. So, you know, you could do worse than CJ on the Bengals. Third up on this list is Chris Herndon of the New York Jets, 14% owned. Now, prior, he's someone that was on this list probably the last two or three weeks, and I was never excited about him. But prior to Sunday, where we saw Herndon uh, set a career high in, in yards with 62, matched the season, and obviously a career high with four catches, so he went four for 62 on Sunday. Prior to week nine, he had scored a touchdown in three straight games. Now, he led the team in receptions and yards, and he seems to be developing a strong chemistry with Darnold now. And uh, over that span, from week six to nine, Herndon is the tight end six in fantasy football behind Kelsey, Howard, LJ Howard, George Kittle, Trey Burton, and Greg Olson. So he has quietly been very, very, very good over the last month of the season. Now, of course, he's not exciting because a lot of his production has come straight from touchdowns. And touchdown dependency, as we've talked about a million times, is not something to rely on, especially not from an offensive player on the New York Jets. But the big game on Sunday was definitely a welcoming sight in terms of snaps and in terms of targets and getting more involved in the offense from a yardage standpoint. Um, he's someone to keep a close eye on. And they got a home game against Buffalo, then a bye, then the Patriots. So he's got a pretty good matchup going forward. And I think he's just someone that, you know, you just have to have on your radar. Last guy on this list is Jeff, 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 <coughs> the Broncos, tight end, Jeff Herman. Herman. Honestly, I don't know how to pronounce half these guys' names. I don't really care. But y'all know who I'm talking about. We're going to go with Jeff Hefe. We're going to go, you know, it's Jeff H, so we're going to go with Hefe from here on out. We're just calling him Hefe. He was only owned in 1% of leagues, and this was a great call by the fellow Big Dogs blogger, Fantasy FB God, Noah. Shout out, Noah, who is going to be joining me on my videos probably starting in week 11. Um, I think on, every, every Thursday, I think I'm going to have him on for the videos so he can start playing a more prominent role on the video side of things. But if you don't follow him on Twitter, I would highly suggest you do so. He's, he's given out gorgeous little golden nuggets like this all the time. And this was his little analysis last week. This was prior to Sunday's game. Hefe has seen 12 red zone targets and five end zone targets on the year. Since week four, he has played in over 82% of the offensive snaps. He has averaged 4.4 targets per game over that span. Now, of course, Demarius Thomas is gone, contributing seven targets a game to this offense, which could open up a lot more opportunities for him. He is a sneaky upside play during buys and... He was right on. Hefe had uh, a really, really big game in week nine. He's caught 10 of 11 targets, 83 yards, and a touchdown. So he's getting more and more involved. His back-to-back -back games with a touchdown. Now the usage is what's encouraging. He hasn't been producing much. This was the first game that he produced, but he's absolutely someone to keep an eye on. He has a bye this week, so he will be on this list again probably next week. But he gets the Chargers and then Pittsburgh at home after that. So he is uh, another streaming option for you guys. And let's move over to the defensing Def <laughs> defensive uh, special teams streamers of the week. As always, guys, the three things to look for are, are you favorites in the game? Are you at home? And a low over under total. All these you could just find by going on Google and typing in week 10 NFL odds or week 10 NFL game lines or whatever like that. So it's not that hard to figure out. Just do it. First up on this list. 52% owned the Los Angeles Chargers. They're playing at Oakland, so they're not home, but this, you couldn't have a better matchup. They are 10-point favorites in a 50.5-point over-under. So they are expected to dominate this game. The Chargers have been looking better and better and better, uh, especially on the defensive side of things, just as a team overall. So I like the Chargers a lot in this one. 52% owned New York Jets versus the Buffalo Bills. They're at home. Of course, this is going to be an easy streamer against the Bills. 
They are seven and a half point favorites with an over under of 37 points. This means that Vegas projects the Bills to score like 12 points. I didn't do the math, but I think that's about what it is. So the Jets are, I'm not sure who I like more, but I think the Chargers and the Jets are both phenomenal streaming options this week. Uh, the Green Bay Packers versus the Miami Yolfins. Packers are at home. They are 21% owned and they are an eight and a half point favorite, 47 and a half point over under. They are expected to win this game big at home. Green Bay plays a lot better defense when they are at Lambeau. Um, you know, Miami's going to have to travel to Green Bay where maybe the weather's a little cold. I haven't checked the weather forecast, but maybe it, you know, tightens them up a little bit. The Dolphins will be playing again with a backup quarterback, um, a banged up offense without a lot of weapons. So I like the Packers here. The last one I like is the 49ers versus the New York Giants. They are only 20% owned. They are a three point favorite with a 43 and a half point over under. So a low scoring game. The Niners defense has looked Pretty damn good over the last few weeks, despite having a horrible offense to supplement them. But I like I, I like the Niners a lot as a streaming option. So we have the Chargers, the Jets, the Packers, and the 49ers as the top streaming options. And, uh, and that's going to wrap up this week's waiver wire video. So I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please leave that thumbs up. Leave a comment down below. Um, let me know what y'all think. If you got any sit starts, trade questions, whatever, whatever. If you want more personal access to your mans, you can check me out on patreon.com slash BDGE where you can subscribe and get a private weekly live stream. You can get a community where everyone asks questions and posts shit online. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So check it out, patreon.com slash BDGE. Subscribe to the channel if you are new and I'll see y'all on Thursday's video with my top trade targets. Buy low, sell high candidates of week 10. Let's get it.